Thank you, everybody. It's been a great day. I'm extremely excited to be part of this. I was part of it last year virtually, and I'm so excited that it was possible to be here in person this year. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know about the gut-brain axis and your gut microbiome within the context of Parkinson's risk and perhaps some opportunities that we might have to slow down or delay the onset of symptoms. There are a few disclosures about some uh, collaborations and consultancies that I have, um, grant review panels and editorial boards that I am uh, affiliated with, as well as our funding support. And I'm going to try to address five questions, not two number threes, but five questions. What causes brain inflammation? Is there evidence of inflammation in Parkinson's? Are there certain types of cells or proteins, genes, or hormones that might contribute to inflammation in Parkinson's? And the next is, how does good gut health protect against inflammation and benefit you? And the last one is, what might be the best way to keep, keep inflammation down? So this schematic may seem complex, but it's just to make the point that the brain communicates with all your external organs. The brain senses everything. And it communicates using hormones and using things called cytokines that um, send signals to other organs, and the other organs send signals back to the brain. And this communication is absolutely critical for good brain health. And when this communication starts to break down, and it does as we start aging, then that's what sets up the opportunity for disease. Now. Because of infectious disease, including things like COVID-19, there has been strong evolutionary pressure to develop genes and gene variants to give you strong immune responses so that you don't pass on infectious disease between you and your neighbor. However, we have lived a little bit too long. And because of this increased longevity, we are now subject to something called antigenic load or chronic antigenic load. And what that means is that we have had repeated infections, repeated environmental exposures, and all that adds up, kind of like a dance card, if you will. And between that and the aging of the immune system, we feel that these things come together as a perfect storm, along with something called inflammaging, and it's not a typo, it's inflammaging, and that's low chronic inflammation in your entire body as you start aging. And the aging actually starts at around age 30, if you believe it or not. So remember that age is the number one risk factor for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and we believe that the aging of the immune system is an important factor that contributes to the risk of these diseases, and I'm going to try to explain why. We know that Parkinson's has both motor and non-motor features, and we know from this schematic of my colleague Michael Okun that you can have a very active lifestyle, but we also have off periods like we heard about this morning, and we try to figure out how to get the most out of Parkinson's uh, living because you have Parkinson's, but Parkinson's does not have you. And the idea here is to try to figure out how to delay, if we possibly can, the progression from a non-motor symptom, which we believe are earlier symptoms, into the motor uh, symptoms that come later. And so this is from a schematic of a review that we recently published explaining how we understand the progression into Parkinson's. And you're born with so many dopaminergic neurons in your brain, 
And you have to cross this threshold into the yellow area to develop a clinical motor symptom. However, two decades before that, there are changes that begin and they involve non-motor symptoms in the green. And it is that two decade stint where we believe the perfect storm of immune system aging and other changes, including environmental exposures that come together with your genes and give you combined risk for when you're gonna cross that threshold. So you can't change your genes just yet, but you can change the environmental exposures that you are going to experience. And that's the good news. And so we have chosen to focus on those two decades before the onset of motor symptoms to try and figure out if we can look at a person's immune system and pick out clues about who is at risk and how we can target their immune system, maybe their gut microbiome, to try to slow down or even perhaps arrest the progression of Parkinson's disease. So this is another schematic that pretty much says the same thing, that there are environmental factors that disrupt your immune system and increase the risk of Parkinson's, and they can alter your immune cells, they can cause direct tissue damage, and they can also affect your immune system itself. And together, they cause brain inflammation. It may take a lot of years, and you may not even notice it's happening. But if we look carefully at other places, not the brain, we may be able to pick out who is experiencing these changes. So you all know about this plaque-like protein that accumulates in most Parkinsonian brains. It's called synuclein. It's the amyloid of Parkinson's. And we know from genetics that synuclein can aggregate and can glum up and can cause neuronal death. We know that inflammation is one of those triggers that causes increase in synuclein. So here's the idea, that if you have a mutation in synuclein, or if you have a mutation in uh, amyloid precursor protein, you may be predisposed to triggering inflammation in the brain, microglia, which are the immune cells in the brain, become activated, and they're going to kill immune uh, uh, neuron cells, and you're going to get familial Parkinson's, familial Alzheimer's. Those are very rare, five, maybe 10% of all total cases. What about the other 90%? We call them sporadic or idiopathic. They're not linked to a familial mutation that you can inherit. So how do you get to that neuronal death? Well, we and others have proposed that you don't need a genetic mutation to get to this cycle of inflammation. All you need is these triggers in the blue boxes. Unhealthy aging, environmental exposures, chronic systemic disease, maybe things like physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, and so on and so forth. All those things combine to give you chronic peripheral inflammation. And eventually, over several decades, your brain is going to sense that. Now, this is a model. This is a controversial model that we have proposed to link peripheral inflammation to the brain. And it's being tested, and again, we need to see if it's true or not. Now, what is the evidence that there is inflammation in Parkinson's? Well, we know for brain autopsies that there's inflammation. But what does that mean? We don't know if it's causative, right? It just happened at endpoint. Well, we know from the genetics that there are some immune genes that are predisposing you to increased risk for Parkinson's. And some of these are the HLA genes that are used for tissue typing. We know from PET scans of live individuals that they have inflammation in their brain. So that cannot be an endpoint. That's actually while you have the disease. And we know from your blood and your plasma, and I'll show you some examples, as well as your stool, that there is inflammation going on. But we don't know when it started, and that's the problem. We don't know whether it's driving your disease, and that's the problem. And finally, from epidemiological studies, which are all associative, they can never imply causation, we know 
that there's association of infections as well as uh, inflammatory bowel disease and consumption of NSAIDs that modulates the risk for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and I'll tell you about that shortly. So the non-murder symptoms, they're all listed here. You're all very familiar with them. We have chosen to focus on the GI dysfunction, and this is why. It is based on the idea that the synuclein protein is going to aggregate in the gut, in the periphery, and because of inflammation, it's going to increase in its amount, it's going to aggregate, and it's going to travel from the gut into the brain, okay? Controversial, yes. Has it been shown to happen? Only in animal models and in non-human primates. It's very difficult to prove this in a human because it takes decades, right? So this is the hypothesis that you have an event in your gut that's causing you inflammation over many, many decades, and that that acts like a trigger, okay? And that causes the synuclein to aggregate, propagate from the gut into your brain. Maybe it also goes through your blood. We don't know. But they have found immune cells in Parkinson's patients that show that they have seen synuclein somewhere and that they have been primed to attack it. So maybe it's true. But how could this happen? Well. Let's look and see if there's any evidence of inflammation in people's guts that have Parkinson's. So what is the gut microbiome? So you have microbiomes in a lot of places. You have microbiome at every place that your body is in contact with the exterior world. You have a skin microbiome, you have an oral microbiome, you have vaginal microbiome, you have a gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome has gotten, of course, the most attention. And the gut microbiome, uh, where does it come from? Well, the fetus is, for all practical purposes, sterile. And when the fetus is born through the vaginal canal, it acquires the mother's vaginal microbiome. And it starts to change as that baby takes mother's milk or formula, and then it starts eating solid food, and then, you know, diet. And so it changes throughout life. And that bacteria and viruses and fungi, because they're all in there, is influenced by what you eat, by your genetics, and by your environment. And most of those bacteria are good. They're needed to absorb nutrients. If you don't have them, you die. And they're also needed to keep your uh, intestine, uh, to be able to tell the difference between good things and things that you shouldn't absorb, right? And they regulate your immune system. We have immune cells in the gut that actually talk to the immune cells in the brain, believe it or not. And that's been a new revelation in the last five to 10 years. Now, what about antibiotics? What happens when you take antibiotics? You wipe out your gut microbiome. That's a bad thing. But guess what? They bounce back. They come back and they repopulate after you eat, again, the food that you eat. However, if you take too many antibiotics, you leave space for opportunistic bacteria that take over the good bacteria. The good bacteria are called commensals, right? And if the bad bacteria take over, guess what? That's when you are sometimes prone to things like C. difficile that can kill you. And if C. difficile takes over, you need a fecal microbiota transplant to save your life, okay? So gut bacteria are absolutely critical for your health, your survival, and for the brain health. Now, this is a schematic of the gut, and normally this gut bacteria are living in the lining of your gut, and they uh, have a very good communication with the barrier, the epithelial cells that are tight. They don't let the bacteria go into the deep layers where the immune cells are, live. But when the bacteria of the lining get out of whack, guess what happens? those tight junctions get leaky. That's what we call leaky gut. And then the bacteria penetrate into the innermost uh, areas and the immune cells become activated. That's how you get a lot of inflammation going and those, those cells that are tight and together express the nucleon. Why? Because they secrete things and cells that secrete things express the nucleon just like neurons do. So we think what happens is 
the immune cells in the line, the gut um, bacteria in the lining get out of whack. They cause inflammation underlying below. The synuclein in the epithelial cells increases. And guess what? These barrier cells um, that become leaky, they're in contact with enteric neurons in your gut that are then connected to your vagus. And your vagus is connected to your brain. So there's a highway that exists between your gut and your brain. Is it possible that the synuclein goes from there to your brain? Possible, but has not been proven, okay? So how can we deal with this? How can we target it? Well, a long time ago, a very talented postdoc in my lab thought, you know, I think there's inflammation all along this highway, from the gut to the you know, midbrain, to the higher order, the depression that people feel has got to be inflammation driven, the, you know, the GI dysfunction. Um, we know from animal models and, and human, non-human primate models that inflammation kills dopaminergic neurons and if, we, and if we target the inflammation, we can save them. I mean, we've, we've cured Parkinson's disease in, in rodents many times, but that's because we know when it's gonna start. So, Keep in mind then that you have this connection between the brain, the blood, and the gut, okay? Immune cells in the brain, immune cells in the blood, immune cells in the gut. That is complicated. This is a very complicated picture that we're dealing with now. And luckily, neuroscientists are now learning immunology, and immunologists are learning neuroscience. And we're finding out about these things that the microbes make Things like short-chain fatty acids, you've heard of them, right? Short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria, guess what they do? They're anti-inflammatory, okay? So the gut microbiome has been demonstrated to play a role in a lot of diseases, and one of them is Parkinson's. Why? Because we have the ability to sequence the bacteria's DNA, and we can tell who's there, who's there and who's not. And through many, many studies, now there's been like 18 or 20 studies, we can now tell that there's certain bacteria that's increased and certain bacteria that's decreased in Parkinson's. And some of the bacteria that are decreased are those that produce short-chain fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory. So that kind of fits, right? You lose those, you're gonna get less anti-inflammatory potential, maybe that's what contributes to the inflammation, right? And you have an increased amount of opportunistic pathogenic bugs. Yikes. So was that a result of the Parkinson's or did that cause the Parkinson's? Have no idea. So don't let anybody tell you that probiotics right now are going to slow or cure your Parkinson's. There is no scientific evidence that says that. The only scientific evidence we have is that some probiotics will lower your gut inflammation. And if that is what you are looking for, then by all means, you know, use them. If they make you feel better, if they deal with your constipation, absolutely, that is, you know, a good reason to use them. But there is still no good evidence that anything slows down the disease. We hope to get to that point, but we're still not there. Now. We did a study comparing spouses and people with Parkinson's, and we asked them about their um, you know, GI issues and other things, and we found four factors that were different between spouses and Parkinson's patients. And it's important to compare to the spouses, because if somebody compares Parkinson's with control someplace else, that's kind of like cheating, because they don't live in the same house. So you really need to compare with someone in the same environment. So we did find four factors that were different. So I do believe, this is looking in the stool, by the way. So I do believe that there, there is inflammation, and we, we looked at it not just in the bacteria and saying, okay, the bacteria might be you know, out of whack. We wanted to see evidence of inflammation in the patient's stool, and we found it. We also found that there was twice the incidence of anxiety, depression, insomnia, digestive problems, um, and di diagnosed or suspected IBD, IBS, or Crohn's and colitis in the Parkinson's um, patients versus the spouses. So 
We then repeated a study, this time in Finland. We said, well, maybe this is just Americans. What about, you know, another cohort? And this time we measured the short-chain fatty acids in the stool. And we measured things in the plasma. And we found that, sure enough, you see less butyrate, uh, less propionate in the PD patients. These are short-chain fatty acids that have anti-inflammatory capabilities. So it does seem that the bacteria that make the short-chain fatty acids are decreased and the short-chain fatty acids themselves are decreased compared to the controls. They also have something called calprotectin in higher levels. And calprotectin is a biomarker for people that have IBD. So is it possible that patients with Parkinson's are looking like patients with IBD? Possibly, right? We have a possibility here that they might have leaky gut, and this might explain the inflammation. And I'll show you one other epidemiological study that suggests that, right? But we're investigating that. Now, is there a correlation be short, between short-chain fatty acid and clinical symptoms? So this is what we found. We found that there were higher levels of stool short-chain fatty acids and lower levels of certain inflammatory factors that are pro-inflammatory correlated with later onset of PD symptoms. So people that had more short-chain fatty acids that were anti-inflammatory seem to have later onset. Again, it's a correlation. We really would have to run the clinical trials with short-chain fatty acids to see if we can delay onset, okay? This is definitely not to imply causation. Now, what is the best diet or intervention for good gut? So the most important thing is that you need to check with your physician. And my colleague, Carly Rush at University of Florida, she is a neurology dietitian. She published a recent study on the Mediterranean diet showing that uh, in a small study, people with Parkinson's that stuck to a five-week single-arm pilot study had reduced constipation. So that's a, that's a win, right, because who wants that? But again, there hasn't been a study long enough to really show effect on clinical progression. And she also has a YouTube um, a video where you can find out a lot of diet strategies. So I, I urge you to, to look those up. Lori Mishley also has a lot of holistic, naturistic approaches to diet in Parkinson's, and you can um, look at that one. She discusses nutrients and risk factors. So back to the hypothesis of gut inflammation. Is this the way that things uh, spread? Well, inflammatory bowel disease is many times an, you know, an autoimmune condition, and you know, the genetic predisposition genes are there. They, they're not really shared much with Parkinson's except for one gene, and that's LARC2. There are some LARC2 variants that give you Parkinson's, familial Parkinson's, and there are different LARC2 variants that give you IBD. But the same gene does kind of anchor the two diseases, which is why my lab is studying that. And we're comparing IBD patients with PD patients with controls, and we're taking colonic biopsies and stool and blood and trying to figure out if there's a signature that looks the same. There are environmental risk factors for IBD, and we know how disease starts. And we know that, you know, the IBD diagnosis comes when you have an uncontrolled immune response and you have a lot of remodeling of, of the gut, right? And, and, and it's a very kind of different disease. But nevertheless, there are some similarities in terms of the leakiness of the gut. Sometimes the leakiness of the gut causes the lipopolysaccharide or LPS or endotoxin, right? When you, when you have um, uh, food poisoning um, and you get um, you know, diarrhea, you've got an endotoxin in your system. That is something that the gram-negative bacteria make. So LPS in your bloodstream can be measured and it's a sign of leaky gut and a lot of patients with neurodegenerative diseases, not just PD, have signs of leaky gut. So it's not necessarily unique to PD, but we are definitely finding it in PD. Now, are there epidemiological studies that suggest that people with IBD have more PD or vice versa? There are. There are small studies 
that came out of Mount Sinai showing that individuals of Ashkenazi descent have IBD and they're more likely to also have PD. Unless these individuals are on anti-TNF therapy. And if they are on anti-TNF therapy, the reduction in PD is 78%. So again, not to imply causation, but there seems to be an association with increased gut inflammation and treating that gut inflammation that modulates the risk. So when I was in biotech before starting my own lab, I developed a new class of TNF inhibitors. And this class of TNF inhibitors is a little different than the ones that are on the market now. This one is in clinical trials. And the unique thing about Expro is that it does not block both kinds of TNF, the one that is soluble, that promotes inflammation, and the one that is bound to a cell membrane. And the one that's bound to a cell membrane, you need it to fight infection, okay? So the difference between this drug and the ones that are currently on the market is that the ones currently on the market block both, both forms. And because of that, you're immunosuppressed, okay? So you have an increased uh, chance for tuberculosis. And so while you get rid of the inflammation, you now are immunosuppressed. And so the Expro is a little bit better, and we feel that if it gets to the market, it may be the better drug so that you have less inflammation but no immunosuppression. The Alzheimer's Association funded a phase 1B trial in Alzheimer's disease in Australia, and people with inflammation and early Alzheimer's were recruited. Small trial, and they were treated for um, three months. And basically, they got an MRI and CSF, and about 25 factors were reduced in the CSF of inflammation. Uh, in the high dose, it was an open label, so everybody knew what they were getting. And this CSF inflammation decrease correlated with something called free water, and that's an indirect measure of inflammation by MRI. And they also measured white matter integrity. And basically, that showed that the axons were less inflamed. So we think that this soluble TNF targeting drug is going to be useful for targeting soluble TNF-dependent inflammation in the gut and may be able to mitigate some of the chronic inflammation that patients with PD or any other risk factor, chronic inflammatory disease, may have that may uh, increase the risk for PD. Thank you.